Hi there, my name is Miss Linnea and I'm with you for your almost last week of TNT. We are in section 4.7 and we're talking about being an agent of grace. We all need God's grace, right? And we're going to talk about what it looks like and how it can change your life and why we need it even after we've accepted Jesus as our Savior. Think of life for a second, kind of like a maze. Have you ever been through a maze? Maybe a hay bale maze or a corn maze or some kind of maze set up at an amusement park or pumpkin patch or something like that. Take a look at this maze. This maze is from England and you can actually visit this maze. It's a garden that they created and it's really, really cool looking, isn't it? Visiting a maze like that would be really fun. But our lives can sometimes feel a bit like a maze, can't they? Sometimes we're not sure which way to go. Sometimes we feel like we've run into a dead end. But the really cool thing is that no matter how you're feeling, no matter what's going on, God is compassionate and loving and kind. And he's with you all the way through your life to guide you, to tell you which way to go, and just to be with you and give his grace to you so that you can be everything that he has called you to be. He wants to guide you and be there and help you along the way. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 10, your memory verse. This was written by Paul, and Paul had an amazing story and an amazing life. And this was written um, while he was doing exactly what God called him to do. So let's read it together. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary... I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Paul's life had been transformed by Jesus. He knew that he was only who he was because of what God had done in his life. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. He knew that there was nothing that he could do for God on his own, that everything he did for God was because God created him to do it, but not just that helped him to do that, gave him the power and the strength and the courage and the grace to be able to do the things that he did for God. Paul's goal was to share the gospel to everybody that he met and everybody he talked to. And he went to places where no one else had gone to, to share with them who Jesus was and what Jesus did for everybody who's ever lived. But he didn't start out that way. Let's go to Acts chapter 8, and I'm going to read you verses 1 to 3. Acts 8, verses 1 to 3. And Saul approved of his execution. We're talking about Stephen. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Before Paul did everything that he did for God, he was named Saul, and he was not a nice guy. Anyone who was a follower of Jesus, he hated them. He hated the people that spoke about Jesus, and he didn't just not like them. He went from house to house to find those people, to drag them to prison, to, to persecute them. He was there when Stephen was um, stoned and killed because of what he said about Jesus. It goes on in Acts 9, 1 and 2. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Anyone belonging to the way. We're talking about anybody who trusted in Jesus as their savior. He wanted to um, take them and imprison them. He wanted to take these letters to Damascus, a different city, so that he could find more people that he could imprison and persecute because they believed in Jesus. But this was the turning point for Saul. Let's find out what happened. I'm going to read Acts 9, verse, I'm going to start in verse 3. Now, as he, we're talking about Saul, went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, 
who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days, he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. So Saul's on his way to Damascus. He and his, his traveling buddies, his traveling companions are walking along the road. And suddenly this blinding light comes. And it's not just a light, it's Jesus. And Jesus is talking to Saul and he's saying, why are you persecuting me? Because when Saul was persecuting the men and women and imprisoning them and being okay with them being killed and um, just hurting them, Saul was persecuting Jesus. And Jesus had a bigger plan for Saul. So let's find out what happens. I'm going to read verses 17 through 19, also in chapter 3. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. God sent Ananias to um, pray over Saul and to actually heal Saul. And in that moment, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So for days after this, he spent time learning about Jesus. He spent time talking about Jesus. In that moment, when God met him, when Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, and then Ananias comes and prays over him, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit, he realized that Jesus was God's son, and that Jesus died on the cross for his sins, and that Jesus had saved him from an eternity in hell. He trusted Jesus as his savior, and he spent days learning about Jesus. And actually, if you keep reading in verse 22, it gets to where Saul is, is now going to be called Paul, and he, he is so confident in who Jesus is that he actually begins proving that Jesus was the Christ. Talk about a radical transformation. Saul went from hating Jesus to proving that he was the Christ, that he saved people from their sins. That's just crazy to me, the work that God can do in our lives. He became a great missionary. He wrote much of the New Testament. He started many, many churches, and he trained other men to serve Jesus and to preach the gospel and to live lives that were completely sold out for Jesus. Even though Paul's after grace testimony, after he was saved testimony is amazing, Paul said that he counted everything, all that he did, all the people that he reached, all the churches that he helped to start as nothing. His greatest goal and his greatest accomplishment in his life was just knowing Jesus. How about you? Let's think back for a second about that maze that we started with. If we think of our lives kind of like they're a maze, let's think about Paul's. He started out going and he didn't just not like Jesus. He didn't just not trust Jesus as his savior. He actively pursued to hurt the people who did. He actively hated Jesus and persecuted Jesus. And God met him at a dead end and transformed his life. He filled him with the Holy Spirit and he, he did great things for God. He fulfilled the purpose that God had created him to do. Once he trusted Jesus as his savior, his life wasn't easy. His life wasn't perfect. He still hit those spots in his maze of life that he didn't know where to go, but God showed him what to do. God was there guiding him through the maze of his life, and he helped him to know the right way to go. When he was the one hated by others, when he was the one persecuted by others, when he was the one that was imprisoned and beaten for loving Jesus, God and his grace strengthened him and encouraged him and was there to help him know what to do. And it's the same for us. 
God's grace, his gift to us that we don't deserve of a salvation, of salvation, of a relationship with him, of forgiveness of our sins. God gives us that freely. All we have to do is accept that. All we have to do is trust Jesus as our savior. And when that happens, we're saved by God's grace. We're saved from an eternity in hell to an eternity in heaven with Jesus. And not just that, God's grace will strengthen us. It will encourage us. It will empower us and protect us and help us know where we are supposed to go in our lives as well. You've each been created and I've been created with a specific purpose. Let's let God's grace guide us through our lives so that we can do everything that he has created and wants to empower us to do. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your gift of grace. I thank you that you are offering us salvation, that you are offering us, God, through your grace and by your grace and eternity in heaven with you. I thank you that that grace, though, is not just for our eternity, but it's for now. It's to help us and guide us and encourage us and protect us and strengthen us to be everything that it is that you have created us to be, to become more like Jesus and do what it is that you've created us to do. We love you. Thank you, God, for your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Bye.